Chapter 7. An Exciting Stunt Oh, no, you can't, said Holly. You can have White Nose, but you can't have the kittens. Why can't I? Did you lose the kittens, too? Holly asked. Well, no, Joey admitted. Holly smiled. Then you can only have what you lost, said the little girl. The other children had never thought of this, but it did seem to make sense. Joey reluctantly agreed to take the cat and leave the kittens. He told the children that White Nose's other name was Buttermilk. Come on, Buttermilk, he coaxed. We're going home. But the cat did not move. See, said Ricky, she doesn't want to go with you. She wants to stay with her kittens. I'm going to take her anyway, said Joey. He glanced around the cellar and saw an old basket with a cover. Then Joey reached down and grabbed the cat around the middle. The angry cat scratched and meowed, but Joey pushed her roughly into the basket and slammed the cover down and sat on it. Now I have you, he said triumphantly. You're not gonna get away from me again. What are you gonna do with her? Pam asked. Lock her in our storage room. Joey replied. That'll teach her not to run off. The Hollister children felt very sorry for White Nose and her kittens. The babies were big enough to stay away from their mother, although no one would have thought so, the way White Nose scratched and cried inside the basket. The children opened the cellar door for Joey. He carried the cat out into the backyard. She was still crying and scratching. I think I'll know what I'll do to her, Joey said. I'm going to cool her off in the lake. But cats don't like water, Pam pleaded. I'll make this one like water, Joey said. Then the boy went out onto the end of the dock and lowered the basket into the water. The cat did not like this treatment one bit. When the water was near the top of the basket, the lid suddenly flew off. The cat sprang out and scratched Joey's hand. As the boy jumped back to get out of the way, he tripped on the dock. Catch him, catch him, shouted Pam to Pete, who was near him. But it was too late. With a big splash, Joey Brill fell over backwards into the water. He went completely under, then struggled to the surface. Pete reached down and helped him back onto the dock. That cat! Where's that cat? Joey shouted. White Nose, who was no more in favor of the dunking than was Joey, had scampered up to the topmost branches of a high tree. You Hollisters are going to pay for this, he shouted as he stomped off toward his home. When he was out of sight, White Nose came down cautiously out of the tree. With her tail high in the air, she pranced across the lawn like a drum majorette and walked to the cellar door. Holly let her in. The kittens mewed when they saw their mother, and Holly brought them a bowl of milk. At noontime, Mr. Hollister returned for lunch. Now that he had Tinker in as a storekeeper, he often came home at 12 o'clock to eat. Today, Mr. Hollister seemed to have something on his mind. Are you thinking up a new invention, Dad? Pete asked. Not exactly, son. I'm trying to think of a way to get more business for the trading post. Isn't business good? Asked Pam. Yes, it's good, her father replied, but I'm going to have to do a lot more business if I want to make a real success of my store. Mrs. Hollister smiled at her husband and said, what is your idea for getting more customers at the trading post? We have to figure out some sort of a stunt, said Mr. Hollister, something to advertise the place. Holly spoke up. I have an idea. Why couldn't we write letters to everybody in town telling them what a wonderful place the trading post is? Mr. Hollister thought the idea was pretty good, but sometimes people did not read advertisements. This has to be something spectacular, Mr. Hollister said. What is a speck on a tackler, Daddy? said Sue. All the children laughed, and her father explained to his little girl that spectacular meant exciting, 
like putting on a little circus in your backyard. Then let's have a little circus, said Sue eagerly. The word circus suddenly made a plan click in Pete's mind. He snapped his fingers. Circus balloons. Why couldn't we have a stunt with balloons, he asked. While the rest of the family listened intently, Pete outlined the plan. The Hollisters would blow up a lot of balloons. In three of them, they would put a slip of paper, which would say, at the trading post, you will receive a prize. Then all of the balloons would be dropped off a high steeple of a church in the center of town. Naturally, all the children would rush for the balloons. And let the air out to see who's lucky, said Holly. No, they have to bring them to the store blown up, Pete declared. That'll make everyone go to the trading post to see who has the lucky numbers. I think that's a dandy idea, said Pam. What do you think, Daddy? Mr. Hollister agreed. He would advertise the scheme in the newspaper and bring home a big box of balloons from the trading post. That night, the children could blow up the balloons for the grand stunt. That afternoon, Pete telephoned the sexton of the old church. He said he would be very happy to let the children drop balloons from halfway up the steeple. When Mr. Hollister brought the balloons home that night, the whole house buzzed with excitement. Pam wrote many little slips of paper. Each one said, buy your toys at the trading post. But on three special ones, it also said, this is a lucky number balloon. The trading post has a prize for you. While Pam was doing this, Ricky, Holly, and Pete were blowing up the balloons. Some were round, others were long. They came in all sizes and were red, yellow, white, green, and blue. Before bedtime, all the balloons were ready. Pam counted them. There were 102. The children tied short strings to each balloon and held them in bunches, like the balloon men at the circuses. Just as they were finishing their job, Pete glanced toward the window. He saw a head bob quickly out of sight. Who's there, he called. There was no reply as Pete hurried to look out. It was dark and quiet. Maybe it's the old man walking in his sleep, Ricky said with a grin. Let's invite him in and give him a balloon. Don't be silly, Holly scolded. It might have been just a shadow. In order to make certain it was not a prowler, Pete ran out the back door and looked around the house. He could see nobody. Then he came back inside and helped the others put the balloons in one corner of the living room. Early the next morning, word quickly spread among the children about the Hollister balloons. When are you going to drop them? Dave Mead wanted to know. At one o'clock this afternoon, Pam replied. After lunch, Mr. Hollister drove the children and the balloons to the trading post. What are the prizes going to be? Ricky asked. I haven't decided that yet, Mr. Hollister replied. What do you think would make good prizes? Ricky said a pair of roller skates. Then Holly suggested a doll if a girl should win. Pam thought a tennis racket might be nice. <clears throat> All right, their father agreed. Those will be the three prizes. What excitement there was as the time drew near to drop the balloons. It was arranged that Pete and Pam should take them up to the opening in the steeple. Ricky and Holly begged to go along. They wanted to see the town of Shoreham from high up. If you promise to be careful, you may go, Mr. Hollister said. At 10 minutes to one, the four children set off for the church. They were met at the door by the sexton, who led them up a long stairway. The children carried so many balloons in their hands that they could hardly see ahead of them. The balloons bounced against their faces and they were very glad when they reached the little balcony. The children down there look just like dolls, Pam said, glancing at the crowd of excited boys and girls. Finally, the hand of the big clock in the church steeple pointed to one o'clock. The bell went bong. 
Let him go, Pete shouted. He and Pam released the balloons amid the shouts of the children below. The balloons scattered in all directions as the wind carried them up and down and sideways. The Hollisters watched for a moment as their little friends made a mad scramble for them. What a scene. Traffic stopped completely as the children ran here and there, jumping and grabbing to get the bobbing balloons. I think we'd better get back to the trading post, Pete said. The kids will be coming in soon. Many of the children's parents had accompanied them to town to watch the fun. Now they all started to enter the trading post. As each balloon was presented to Mr. Hollister, he opened it carefully and took out the little slips of paper. Finally, so many children came in all at once that Pete and Pam had to help him, while Roy Tinker took care of grown-up customers. Presently, a little boy named Phil held up his balloon to Pete, who opened it and read the paper. Here's a lucky number, said Pete. Yippee, yelled Phil. Everybody gathered around the boy. What would you like to have, roller skates or a tennis racket? Mr. Hollister asked. Roller skates. He picked them out. After the Hollisters had let the air out of about 50 balloons, Anne Hunter rushed in. I found this one over by the lake, she said breathlessly. Pam opened it. Another lucky number. Oh, Anne, I'm so glad you won, Pam said. Well, young lady, what would you like to have? Asked Mr. Hollister. A doll or a tennis racket? Anne chose a cute doll with golden curls. The excitement continued as other balloons were opened. As they reached 92, Joey Brill rushed in, shoving the other children aside. He had a balloon in his hand. Open it, he demanded. Pete took out the slip of paper. Another lucky number, he cried out. Ugh, whispered Ricky to Holly. He would get a lucky number. Mr. Hollister was just about to give Joey a tennis racket when another boy came in with a balloon. Mr. Hollister smiled, saying, all the lucky numbers are in. Oh, just open mine for fun, the boy pleaded. Pete did this, and Pam glanced at the slip of paper. Oh, Pete, she gasped. It's another lucky number. How could there be four of them? We made only three. 